Uh, so I got to ask you, it's been a question that we've had uh, this week because we had more capital on last week. We had Patrick Morrissey on this week. Uh, we had Senator Shelley Moore Capito on this week. And the question goes back to the governor's debate and your line about you must not be from West Virginia because in this state we don't talk about people's mamas. That is a line that kind of came out of that debate, resonated with a lot of people. It got you a lot of buzz. Got a lot of buzz. Um, I was the only guy during that debate that had several people, you know, with several cheers and ovations, standing ovations. We, we, you know, did very, very well. And people started realizing, okay, wait a minute, this is a legitimate business guy that has built a bunch of, bunch of companies that's a good, solid, fundamental conservative that uh, um, can get into our state and make a difference. So um, I, I, I had a good time with t it. I really did. Tell me about the mama line, though. Well, I... Just it's natural, the truth, right? Organic? I mean, you don't talk about somebody's mama. You don't do that. I mean, no matter if you have an issue with her policy or not, it's not she. She wasn't the person on the stage for the debate, and we all know what it's like being born and raised here. Yeah, it's just one of those things, man. Even when you're a kid, you talk about somebody's mama, you can have a problem on your hands. So, part of it was just setting things straight. There's certain things if you want to talk about something somebody did. That's all fine and dandy, in particular the person that you're running against. When you start talking about their mom, man, that is totally out of hand. And that's the other thing. There's no connection, right? Um, that, that's just, you, you cannot attack somebody's position on something based on something their mom did. That's just my two cents. You started your campaign for governor with the first thing you had to overcome being that people didn't know outside of your area who Chris Miller was. Yes, sir. Uh, you've traveled the state a lot. Uh, you've been running your car dealership ads here in the Eastern Panhandle since high school football season began. And your numbers are coming up. Now people understand a bit more about who Chris Miller is. Yeah, so that, that that's part of what an election is, right? Is that, um, you know, it's kind of a marketing contest. But more importantly to me, I think that we're... Um, uh, selecting a leader, and in particular, the governor of the state really is the CEO, and his job is to solve problems and report to the taxpayers, and quite frankly, treat them more like shareholders. Because I think that that relationship is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. But I've been, you know, traveling all around the state, getting to meet as many people as I can. Anytime I get a chance to speak to people, it really, really works out well. Any chance I get to be on a stage with the rest of the people running, it really, really works out in our favor. And so you'll you'll kind of laugh at this. Um, as of right now, the future debate have all been canceled because um, two of the opponents aren't willing to appear on stage with me anymore. Which two would that be? Um, I'd rather not say. Well, I can, you can I, take a guess. I can, I can say this. We, we've invited all four candidates to the Eastern Panhandle for a debate. Mac Warner, I got an email from Mac's group that they've accepted. I assume you would accept. Absolutely. I, I'm not putting you on the spot or whatever. And by simple subtraction, who does that leave, I would Rob? leave more Capito and Patrick <laughs> Morrissey, as, as I'm assuming who you're well, imagine implying. That. Um, and, and that's okay, right? Um, this is str strategic. They're wanting to make sure and separate themselves from me because when you get me on a stage with everybody else, people go, wait a minute, that's a smart, good, solid business guy, and he doesn't sound like the rest of those politicians out there. So, you know, I like those odds a lot. And, you know, if I have to do it a different way, that's all fine and dandy. But the most important thing is these, these, these politicians, this political class forgets that elections are always about the voter. They're not about the political class. They are about the voter. And when you have the right message that resonates with them, with the voter, it matters. So you're, you're described by people as a force of nature, a person with a ton of energy. Uh, Hurricane Chris Miller, right? If you were a wrestler, that'd be a great name for be you. A great name. I, I, I'd take it. My, my, I, so as a boxer, and my nickname in boxing was the Fighting Governor, which is quite the Fighting ironic. Governor. That's right. <laughs> so, but but translate that to how you would uh, be in the governor's mansion, trying to bring. Uh, a conservative House and a conservative Senate to the table to do traditional business? Well, it's it's leadership, right? And leadership starts and ends with listening to people, but also understanding to have a vision, and it's problem solving. Um, you know, I, I built a bunch of companies. When I got involved in our businesses, we had two of them. And through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and hard work, I turned it into 26 different enterprises. You know, we're in automotive space, insurance and reinsurance, real estate, bison farming, and I have a data and technology company, too. And that actually is what led me down the path of wanting to run for governor because it matches up problem solving, which is the state's got a serious set of financial challenges. And it just so happens that the way to solve it is you have to grow the economy and we have to add about 200,000 people to the state of West Virginia over the next 10 to 12 years to avert a financial catastrophe. It just so turns out that that data company taught me that we're in the beginning stages of a demographic shift in the country. And it's not as simple as California to Texas and New York and New Jersey to Florida. It's ingrained in basically four things without boring you with the data. It's cultural, it's social, it's economic, and it's political. And when you understand what
what's causing the movement, then you can actually realize that, wait a minute, this matches up with West Virginia because people are looking for something different. When we trapped people down in urban areas surrounded by concrete and they couldn't go to the gym, they couldn't go to church, they couldn't see their friends and family, you know, they couldn't go to comedy shows, it made people really uneasy. And then there's this kind of a liberal mindset infection inside of a lot of these big cities as well that has been infected inside of school systems that people are dying to get away from. Not just, you know, pontificating here, it's based on data. And so you look at West Virginia, we've got a conservative family-based kind of culture. We're surrounded by hills and trees and rivers and streams. We're a stone's throw away from two-thirds of the country's population. And we have something to offer because people are looking for something different. They want a higher quality of life and a lower cost of living. We all know we're dealing with a bunch of rampant inflation. And that's forcing some of the movement. And then you'll find this interesting. Three of the four fastest growing states post-pandemic are Tennessee, Texas, and Florida. And they all have one thing in common, and that's a zero state income tax. And so there's economic things that are moving people. And so when you understand what's going on, and then you look at the state and realize all the problems that we have, then you go, we can use data and our wits to actually solve problems and fix the issues the state is facing down the road. And where I think it all starts and ends, aside from you know tax structure, aside from running government more like a business, aside from realizing that the government doesn't do a very good job of spending and managing our money, and so we need to audit every single dime inside of the state's budget to find all of the waste. And then we need to get very, very organized and realize that we have what the rest of the world is looking for, which is we have an abundance of coal. We have an abundance of natural gas. We now, legally speaking, have the potential for nuclear. And you guys know this being in the eastern panhandle. There's more water that passes through the state of West Virginia than any other state in the country. We have an incredible river system, and we also, legally speaking, own the Ohio River to the high water mark of Ohio. Then you think about what's happening out west, Lake Mead's drying up, Arizona Reservoir's drying up, Colorado River's drying up, dams in Nevada are shrinking to the point where they're uncovering bodies the mafia threw in there to build Las Vegas, California. Allegedly. Utah, allegedly, yeah. (laughs) And West Virginia has what people need because as we grow technology, Everything that we do is going to be about power, and in particular, baseload power. And coal, natural gas, nuclear, and all of that water are baseload power providers. And so we play our cards exactly the right way. Not only can we turn West Virginia into the battery or the power plant of the East Coast, but we can also leverage these resources to be the state in the union with the cheapest power in the country. And that can be one of the primary foundations for all the economic growth and development because power is a fixed cost. Any business that is looking for somewhere, manufacturing, chemical processing, it doesn't matter. Power is a cost that will be relative to where they decide to go. So if you have the right tax structure and the right tax incentives, and then all of a sudden you're located geographically in a very, very good strategic position, and then all of a sudden you've got incredibly cheap power, then that will grow commerce, grow population, grow businesses, and grow people. But more importantly, like you look at the history of our state, we've been extracted for a really long period of time and do not have a lot to show for it. And with all of the assets, thinking as a business guy, right, I look at all of the assets on what is a balance sheet, water, coal, natural gas, nuclear, the incredible amount of rare earth elements that are here, we are finding in West Virginia that not only are there a bunch of rare earth elements in all of these slurry ponds, but there are actual huge seams of rare earth elements inside of our state. And that is the key to power and technology in the future. And so why in the world are we not per capita with all of those assets, the richest state in the country? And what I envision in my mind is, is to leverage all of these resources to drive down the cost of power for our people as well. So not only is it can be the foundation of economic growth and development, but you think of Jim and Susie Adkins, both of them are on Social Security, and they're 74 years old. If you cut their power bill by 50 to 70 percent, you've done something impactful for them, too, in a time that power keeps going up in cost. And everybody's dealing with all this additional inflation because that is more money inside of our economy that they can use to spend to take your grandkids they can use to spend to make sure they're getting nutrition it's a total game changer in my mind
Billy. Yeah, you've opened up a lot of course, a lot of uh, sources of question. Unfortunately, we do not have that much time. You mentioned water, you mentioned Ohio River, and that implied that we had control of the water in the Ohio River. Recent Supreme Court decision on the Potomac River does not says that's not the case. But skipping to uh, to other, you did not mention either solar or windmill as far as your power sources. Why not? So it takes an incredible amount of subsidization to provide any sort of return on investment for either one of those. I think we do need to have an all-encompassing energy policy, right? Anything and everything that works, we need to be using. Um, solar and wind cannot provide baseload power at all. And the most important thing that a country needs is baseload power. So Europe, the reason why Putin is in the Ukraine is that's the direct line of natural gas into Europe. And the European countries were dumb and decommissioned their nuclear stuff under this green energy guise. And now they're going, uh-oh, we can't power our country on solar and wind. So not only are they looking for alternative sources for natural gas, but they are opening up coal-fired power plants in Europe as we speak. And, of course, that doesn't match the media narrative, so that's not being reported, but it's actually happening. Because you have to have baseload power to keep people warm, to power any economy, and to make sure that you're able to grow technology. So that's one of the primary reasons why I omitted that. Sure. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> the elimination of state income tax, is that a day one thing, or is that something we wean ourselves away from at an accelerated rate from where we are now? So right now we're in a position that is weaning it away. I want to accelerate that on day one. I want to sit down and look at the legislature and do everything we can to eliminate it as quickly as possible, because we know, factually speaking, that it is driving population and capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. And so we have to make West Virginia a place that is welcome to capital and welcome to investment and welcome to people. So it will one of the first things I want to tackle. But we still have to pay our bills. Oh, absolutely. And you've got to run state government more like a business. And there's an incredible amount of opportunity, not only, and yes, this is the revenue discussion, right? But the other side of it is expense and waste. And so when I'm talking about running state government more like a business, we need to audit every single dime that the government spends. We need to understand exactly where all the waste is. We have structure issues that could actually, if we relook at them, make sure that us as taxpayers are receiving more overall benefit for the money that we all pay to fund the government. And in my mind, I don't know about you guys, but in my mind, I don't think that my taxes should be used to justify the existence of a big bloated government that wastes our money. I believe that my taxes should appropriately be paid to make sure and run a state and provide us all as taxpayers with a return on investment. And that mindset, I think, is missing from inside of government. So there's a bunch of work to do. And please understand, I, I know exactly what we're getting into because you have to make sure and keep a state budget balanced. You have to make sure and keep a state going in the right direction. But you have to have goals and you have to understand what the consequences are 10 and 12 years down the road if you aren't doing the big forward thinking things right now. Because if we don't focus on this economic growth and focus on this population growth in particular, what happens down the road with the bond rating fiasco? becomes a nightmare for the state. And then you think about all of the rural counties, all of the people all around the state that are dependent upon us. And you start going through dramatic cuts down the road because you have a major financial catastrophe. Martinsburg and Huntington and Charleston aren't going to be the first places that are, you know, that, that are affected, right? The first places that are affected are the places without the population places that are affected are all the rural counties and that's going to be a tough pill to swallow so i want to get out ahead of it and i want to solve it right now to make sure that we're able to keep a lot of the things in place that we love and and hold dear to our hearts which is the ability to be a you know horse ride away from any courthouse in the state because that's kind of how we got designed right chris going going to pacific i think you like most every one of your predecessors running for government says we've got to reduce wasteful spending it sounds great on the campaign trail, but I've not yet seen a single governor actually address this seriously. How would you address reducing our wasteful spending? Let me give you a couple of examples. When the pandemic hit and we sent all these government workers home with laptops to work from home, nobody logged in, nobody did anything, all the data is there, and government still functioned. You can't tell me there's not meat left on that bone. One of the other things that I've talked about is the Department of Education. We've got a we, West Virginia is in the top 18 in the country in dollars spent per student, yet we got terrible results. I mean, we're 50th in education, we're celebrating now because we're 46th in overall economy, and we're still the number one state in the country for grandparents raising grandkids. 
So what happens with education is, is that all of the money that we pay in taxes and what's allocated for education doesn't flow into the classroom to A, pay our teachers more because there's a teacher shortage nationally, not only just in West Virginia, and you guys being right here in the Eastern Panhandle understand that because you got teachers that can jump across the, you know, a board, the border to Maryland or Virginia or wherever else and make more money. And so if we're going to be competitive with education, we got to make sure that the revenue flows to the classroom, A, to make sure and match up with the market on what paying good teachers should be, but then B, that's where the customer is. The customer is the student and the taxpayer. And so, in my mind, the revenue should flow into the classroom to make sure and benefit the customer and make sure that the customer, which is the taxpayer, gets all of their resources. But we got this big bloated Department of Education and this big bloated layer of la layer upon layer of bureaucracy that soaks up all the resources before it goes where it needs to, do, needs to be to interact with the transaction, which is the teacher and the student. And so that's just one of the many things that I, you know, that I see that needs to be adjusted. Chris, like you mentioned Eastern Panhandle and teachers hopping. You run a, a, a business, and yes, your, your people don't make enough money, they leave. They exactly go to the right. next place that'll pay them the most. In the Eastern Panhandle, we need locality pay because our people can't be given raises because the state won't let us. So they hop across the border and they take a job for ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars more somewhere else. Would you support locality pay for state employees if you were the governor? Absolutely. Markets should dictate rates more than anything, and in particular, a particular policy that is antiquated. So um, absolutely, positively all for that, yes. And, and a follow-on, how about uh, uh, independence, uh, the, uh, uh, what's my word? Uh, home rule. Home rule, thank you, Rob. How about home rule? Yeah, so um, it's got its pluses and minuses, right? Because, for example, I've got businesses that are impacted by home rule that have very antiquated taxes, like a B&O tax, that in the industry that I'm in, one of the industries, the automotive space, if you're taxing based on sales cost, not on margin or revenue, then you literally wind up in a position where I'll bid all the time, and if it's an out-of-state company that doesn't have the same B&O tax that I do, um, I literally wind up getting the short end of the stick because I can't compete because it soaks up the margins It's based on sales price. So there's a give and a take, right? You've got to make sure and have cities with the ability to adjust to handle the policies that impact them on the ground level, because all politics is local, right? Um, but at the same time, what you don't want to do is have something in place that is anti-economics, anti-growth, anti-jobs, and anti-competition. So double-edged sword, but I do think we need to make sure and give our cities as much autonomy as possible to solve the problems locally that are on the ground. Chris, final minute is yours. It went by fast. Um, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here and look forward to doing it again. Um, I'm a business guy. I've never been involved in politics before, and I really do think that West Virginia is dying for something different. We've seen what happens with politicians over and over and over again that talk out of both sides of their mouth and say all kinds of words and then don't do anything. And I want to do just the opposite. I want to tell you exactly what I'm going to do, what I'm seeing, and then get in there and execute because there's a window of opportunity in front of us. And it is too big to let politicians handle it. They always get out negotiated. They always enter us into bad deals. And the best people in the world at negotiating are business guys, especially when it comes to representing a, you know, the entire state, because it's really, really easy to spend somebody else's money. It really, really is. And so I want to make sure and run state government a bit more like a business, mm -hmm. enter us into the right deals, grow our economy, grow our population, and have West Virginia basically write one of the greatest comeback stories in the history of the country because we can. we got what people need, and we just got to roll up our sleeves and get to good old-fashioned hard work. Chris, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you guys so much for having me.